Recently, the big DSLR makers like Nikon and Canon have received lots of kudos for their mirrorless cameras. Incredibly high burst rates, silent operation, WYSIWYG eye level finders, their technical chops go on and on. Novelty gives easily bored reviewers something to talk about and makes these mirrorless wonders exciting objects for their back-to-front capped Hi guys, sitting at their desks to wave around and read you the spec sheet. Except that, for Micro Four Thirds users, all this is old hat. I was beginning to think that Olympus was standing still while Canon and Nikon caught up. As with Panasonic, the latest Olympus cameras like the M5 Mark III have been lacking direction, offering nothing more than incremental improvements over the previous iteration. Until the M1 Mark III, I see an interesting course being plotted here. We all accept that mobile phones using advanced artificial intelligence techniques make much better images technically than we'd expect. Olympus seem to be co-opting some of that for their latest flagship cameras, the opening salvo being the handheld high resolution mode and live neutral density filters. But let's deal with the basics first. Especially pleasing is that Olympus have bucked the ever-increasing size trend the dimensions of the Mark II and Mark III are identical. There is, however, a weight increase of 6 grams, equivalent to about a dozen straws, a tiny amount, but which should be noted by National Geographic photographers who travel on camelback while on assignment in the Sahara Desert. There is the supremely comfortable body contouring and comprehensive layout of physical controls, which seems more spacious than you'd expect for what is ultimately a small camera body. Small or not, it handles and feels as you'd expect and hope a top-of-the-line camera body would. To the disappointment of some, it has the same monitor and EVF as the Mark II. But although the Panasonic G9 has better ones, I doubt that anyone would find enough difference for it to tip a buying decision, and both are in themselves very good. Overall, this new Olympus is a handsome beast, with all the controls in the right places. I'd like the new EM5 Mark III if there's nothing that I would change. I don't like the menu button being moved over to the left hand side, but the new joystick had to be accommodated, and something had to move, and in the end it's just something you'd get used to. I do find though that with the four custom modes and the well thought out controls, there isn't much need to access the menus anyway. Speaking of the menu, I still don't like Olympus's menu system, but the My Menu edition nullifies the main criticism of not being able to find anything. It's brilliantly executed, just press the red rec button when you're on an item and it is popped into the My Menu. One more thing, and this really matters. This is the first Micro Four Thirds camera with a USB Type-C plug. It makes a huge difference. Charge the battery, tether to a PC, download files, all using the same reversible plug as your mobile phone. Seriously, a huge difference when compared to the two-part monstrosity used by Panasonic that feels like it'll rip out the innards of the camera because of its weight, or the mini USB that somehow manages always to be the wrong way up. Due to the present strange circumstances, I haven't been able to actually use my M1 Mark III out in the field very much. That's why there are fewer pictures illustrating this video. Mind you, since the horse went into voluntary isolation, there's not much to photograph in the field anyway. The use I have been able to give it does no more than underline what I already thought. There is very little to criticise here. The shutter sounds nice, the silent mode is silent, though I really would like to be able to add a volume controllable like a whisper, or a Hasselblad mirror kalunk to it for childish amusement, but mainly an audible confirmation that the shutter had fired. I really like the new shooting information screen, which gives you a clear oversight of all the camera settings, but leaving you able to toggle the super control panel if you can't alter a setting with a switch or a button and another push going to straight live view, all the while with eye level viewing available. It's all a bit elaborate to set up, but hey, that's what custom settings are for. Basically, in use the M1 Mark III feels the same as the Mark II, but with a few very welcome extras. The performance of the camera is flawless as far as I'm concerned. The Pro Cap with frames up to 60 per second and pre-capture of 35 frames makes it hard to miss a shot. And from my perspective, the L setting giving 10 frames per second with follow focus is a little short of perfect for sports subjects. All this, unlike immediate rivals, can be done while shooting raw files, which will obviously fill the buffer faster, but there's a big buffer, so it isn't a big restriction. The usefulness of 10 frames per second sequencing depends highly on the camera's continuous autofocus performance, of course. 
In present circumstances, I couldn't get out to a sporting event, but all I can say is that I gave my wife, a non-photographer, the camera set to 10 frames per second, all targets, and asked for her to press and hold the shutter while I weaved my electric Brompton as quickly as I could towards her. I knew what to expect from the M5 Mark III that I'd reviewed recently, and as you can see, the M1 Mark III holds on very, very well. It's capable of passing tests much tougher than this, and I cannot see anyone finding fault with it, other than users of specialised professional-grade DSLRs at four times the price. The high-resolution facility is now more useful, in that it can cope with hand-holding up to a point. Using it handheld does lower the resolution from 80 megapixels to 50, but where in other cameras you are aware of multiple shots being taken as the sensor is shifted, this seems to be instantaneous. It can't be, obviously subject movement should be avoided. But the main use for high res will be landscapes and architecture, so it's not really a problem. The live ND filter is interesting. I hoped it would be useful in video, though I knew it couldn't once I saw how it worked. It doesn't cut the light transmission. It gives the effect of a longer exposure by taking several shots and merging them, making water look blurred and flowing. You still need proper glass ND filters for video. This the handheld high-res and the starry sky autofocus are the type of thing you'd find on a mobile phone. Living in London, I couldn't try the starry sky AF, as we don't see stars here. But if I hadn't been confined to home, I might have been able to do some sharp night shots of broken bottles twinkling on the pavement. In terms of noise at high ISO, I'm happy to use the M1 Mark III at 3200 or 6400 at a push and it does seem to be about the best implementation of this sensor I've come across so far. So where does all this leave me? In a very unusual position, because for once I have an unequivocal opinion. I can't have expected to be seeing this, like the Panasonic G90, GX9, Olympus EM5 Mark III and EM10 Mark III, as marking time, as an upgrade, take it or leave it. The M1 Mark III is anything but. First of all, the size, unaltered, is still absolutely right about as small as it could be given its control accessibility, and yet big enough not to make you feel fat-fingered like a mobile phone does. Just about everything is customizable, although you probably won't want to change much on the default physical settings. Video is no longer Olympus's weak point. If you do need better, you need a specialist camera like the Panasonic GH5S. Here is handheld video with digital and sensor stabilization and focusing set to fast. Aside from having a focus puller, you couldn't better this focusing. And as with stills, no hunting back and forth here. It doesn't put a foot wrong. The M1 Mark III has lots of bells and whistles, but no gimmicks. Starry AF is not much use to me, but it will be invaluable for others. I don't need handheld high res and live ND, but I will profit from them and use them because they're there. The M1 Mark III has one massive advantage over its nearest rival, the Panasonic G9, and that is its excellent, reliably solid focusing under all conditions. Phase detection AF for keeping tabs on moving subjects. Contrast detection for sheer accuracy on static ones. And they combine to make this the best focusing micro four thirds of all. Although my recently reviewed EM5 Mark III is no slouch, it must make Panasonic think again about sticking with their depth from defocus technology. The Micro Four Thirds Achilles heel is no more. It's not above criticism. The menu system is still unnecessarily obtuse, and it could be infuriating trawling through it for some custom settings, though the personalised My Menu solves that problem largely. The function lever remains pointless. Why can't it be set to toggle the shutter between electronic and mechanical, for example, or high res and normal? And why, when they supply a handy little flash for the M5 Mark III, isn't there one supplied for the M1 Mark III? Unbelievable. The main criticisms, though, will be the price, the sensor resolution, and the unimproved EVF and monitor. They will come from people who haven't tried and handled this new Olympus. Olympus have done a remarkable job here, putting together a camera that is so much more than the sum of its parts. Here is a camera that can do anything you ask of it, is enjoyable to use, can do a professional job, and even with a full range of lenses won't break your back on a hike. Once I'd have had to add a rider to that anything you ask of it, saying, unless you are a sports or wildlife photographer. There's no longer any need to make such a qualification. Simply a great camera. Thanks for watching.